Hello and welcome to the Mumbles and Things YouTube channel. I'm Maggie if we haven't met before and I'm Maggie if we have met before. <laughs> I was going through some old files on my computer and I noticed a content research survey responses that I, I sent it out like I think it was at the beginning of 2020 and obviously things went kind of crazy in 2020 so I totally forgot that I had done this. But when I found it, I was like, there's a lot of really great questions in here that people have asked of me in the past. And I'm sure if they don't still have these questions, someone else does. So I thought I would do like a series or something on the Mumbles and Things YouTube channel where I just answer these questions and talk to you about my witchcraft experience and um, just advice that I have for people. So if that sounds interesting to you, if that sounds like something you want to see more of, make sure that you hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you're notified every time I post a new video. And without further ado, I will get into some of these questions. So the first question on here, and I'm not going to share people's names in case they want to remain anonymous, but I'll go ahead and answer the questions that people had for me. Um, throughout these video series. I'll just record until I feel like the video is long enough and then we'll pick up where we left off the next time. So this first one is, were you ever in the broom closet? And if so, how did you come out? And I actually recently answered this question on the podcast with my sister. So that's the Talk Witchcraft podcast. If you don't follow me there, then you know make sure you subscribe to that as well. Um, but I'll answer here in case you prefer YouTube over podcasts. So I don't really feel like I was really in the broom closet. I never really felt like I had to hide who I am, but there were definitely times where it felt sort of uncomfortable to share that I'm a witch and I would kind of skirt around it and try to use like coded language in order to, to talk about what I do and how I, what I believe in um, so as to not make other people uncomfortable. But I was really lucky because I grew up with a family that really encouraged questioning things. You know, my my family is Christian, but I never really felt like I had to maintain that religion or be part of that. I do. I did at one point identify as a Christian, and in fact, I was um, one of the youth leaders in our region, and I taught other <laughs> other people, my peer groups you know, how to connect more with their Christian spirituality. I kind of feel like that kind of spurred me later on towards teaching witchcraft now, um, just a different, a different way to view what I believe in, or a different way to view the world through witchcraft and magic rather than like the Christian perspective. So anyway, that's all to say that I, I grew up Christian, and in that belief system, questioning things was really valued. And even in the church that I grew up in, being able to question things, ask about what things were confusing you, asking about how could this story describe that and what and how does this fit in with the scientific understanding of the universe and, and all of that kind of stuff. And so in that upbringing where I was able to question things and, and ask what I was curious about, I was able to sort of form my own understanding of the world and my own belief system, which later led me toward witchcraft, which is a practice that many people find the best thing about witchcraft is that you do get to design your own practice, your own belief system that fits with your experiences and with your understanding of how the world works. Um, so to answer the question, was, was I ever in the broom closet? I don't feel like I was, like I said before, because I didn't feel like I needed to hide that part of myself. And even when I started practicing witchcraft in my 20s, in my early 20s, I was pretty public about it because I was sharing what I knew on my old Tumblr blog. So I was sharing things that as I was learning them and how I was understanding them pretty publicly. I mean, I was using my name. I wasn't necessarily sharing it with people I actually knew. It was more like my internet friends, you know. Um, but even so, I, I didn't feel like I needed to hide that part of myself in that way. And then I started learning more about blogging and things like that. And I started writing longer blog posts and I opened my own website and later that evolved into Mumbles Academy. And um, I attached uh, and sometimes I did hide behind the name Mumbles Academy and I didn't use my name, Maggie Hazeman, 
to talk about the things that I was writing about on my blog. Um, but slowly, and especially after publishing a book, I, I was a lot more um, public with my name in association with witchcraft. So I do think that it evolved from being sort of secretive, sort of um, at least not shouting it from the rooftops, <laughs> to being more comfortable sharing that part of myself with the world. I think that's how everything goes. As you're learning something, you probably aren't that knowledgeable about it in order to share that with other people until you get to a point where you feel really comfortable talking about it because you know so much about it. So that's kind of a long way to answer that question, but hopefully that makes sense. And I do know that there's a lot of people who are in the broom closet. There's places in the world where it is actually, you know, it'll put you, your person in danger to talk about witchcraft and to uh, admit openly that you practice witchcraft. And so there, are, I definitely feel for those people who do have to hide that part of themselves in order to keep themselves safe. If the reason that you don't feel like you want to come out of the broom closet, so to speak, is because you think people will think you're weird <laughs> or because you're worried about what other people are going to think about you. Uh, what I would say about that is that when you share yourself authentically, when you share parts of who you are with the people that you care about, you can be yourself more, you can express yourself more accurately and people can get to know you better. So hiding yourself isn't, you know, isn't, that's showing a false face. So if it's safe to do so, I do think it's worth it to share with the world your witchiness because that's going to normalize it more for other people as well and eventually maybe it won't be unsafe for people in other parts of the world and even in the US where I live. So the next question here is what was it that you had that had you decide on your path? I'm going to interpret that the way that I interpret it. I think it's asking I think it's asking about witchcraft for sure, obviously, because this is a witchcraft survey. I think what it's asking is um, the path that I am on. And I feel like I talked about that a little bit in the previous question, that how I got to where I am. <laughs> um, but more specifically, after deciding that Christianity wasn't really for me, it didn't. There is actually a very specific moment that made me realize that Christianity wasn't for me. I was at church camp with the other youth that were part of my youth um, leadership that I mentioned before. And one of the other leaders was talking about how they knew that they believed in God. And they said that it was like Christmas evening. And you know how excited you get, especially as a child, if you've ever celebrated Christmas, on Christmas Eve, it's so hard to fall asleep because you're just so excited about Santa. Everyone's been like talking to you about Santa for a month and you just want to open your presents, you put out the cookies. And so this person said that they prayed to God that it would be one of those nights where they close their eyes and it, all of a sudden it was morning. You know how that happens sometimes where, you know, you fall immediately asleep and it feels like no time has passed and you're suddenly in the morning time. And that's the kind of night they had. So for them, that was like, it's such a cute story. And that was one way that they felt like, you know, God is there and God is working for me. Um, and in that moment, I didn't really have that feeling. And so I started thinking about things differently. And it's, and I, at the time, I was sort of exploring my way of viewing the world. I didn't necessarily believe in God the way that people were telling me that God existed as like this omnipresent being who, you know, lives in the sky and um, answers all your prayers and all of that, I felt like God was more of like a connecting force that all living creatures on the planet, all humans, all animals and plants, mushrooms, rocks, the water, everything was connected through this like energetic force. And this was before I really studied witchcraft or understood the way that energy moves throughout the world. But that was kind of how I understood God. And the more I heard people talking about their Christian version of God, I felt less and less like I could relate to that. And that's not to say that, that you know, not all Christians view God that way. That's just kind of the way that God was presented to me. Actually, this is reminding me of another story. When I, um, 
I don't know. This is this is a silly story, but when I was a kid, I thought that God was the cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs <laughs> bird. You remember that cereal, and there was like the I don't know what kind of bird it is, but the big yellow beak. For some reason, anytime I would visualize God, it was that bird. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's an aside. Where was I? Oh, so I didn't really understand God the way that people were set telling me about it. And I, but I did know, I did feel like there was some sort of energetic movement in the world. And as I learned more about witchcraft, that idea was more solidified. I was like, oh, okay. So this really, this explains the way that I've been viewing the world. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right way to view the world. It was just something that fit in with what I was seeing and what I was experiencing. And so that's what kind of led me more towards practicing witchcraft and later teaching witchcraft. Another question, I would definitely love to hear Maggie's story of how she came to the craft. That seems to be a very popular question. I feel like I answered that. So we're going to move on to the next one. The best advice she can give for starting out and how she stays connected with her craft. We actually talked about this one on the podcast recently as well, but I'll answer it here again. Um, the best advice that I can give is to not hold your ba yourself back, to just try things. Uh, I feel like when I was first starting out, all I wanted to do was like read and study, and I didn't think that I had was good enough to try anything. I was afraid to cast spells. I was afraid to even like try things with crystals and, and meditation. All I wanted to do was read and I held myself back for so long from actually trying things. But then once I actually tried, you know, setting an intention and, and lighting a candle and, and doing the actual like practical magic, that's when I started learning faster because I was realizing, I was understanding how I wanted to practice, not how someone else in a book or someone else on a website was practicing. And I wanted to learn how to practice the way that I wanted to practice because that's how it was going to fit my lifestyle the best because of the things that I'm interested in and the skills that I already have, the things I already do from day to day, um, putting magic into those things and putting my intention into the things that I already do and enjoy was how I started learning a lot quicker than just reading someone else's words. And I don't mean to discount other, you know, reading witchcraft books. I think that is super important, especially if you are getting information from a huge variety of sources, lots of diversity of opinions. That's going to help you learn as well, for sure. I just know that I waited. I wish I hadn't waited so long to try things for myself, because again, that's how I started learning a lot faster and feeling like I understood how magic fit into my life specifically. So I think that that's the best advice that I can give for somebody who is new. And then the second part of that question was, how does she stay connected to her craft? And I sort of answered that. I think the, the way that I stay connected is that I don't think of magic as something separate from my day-to-day -day life. I don't think about, you know, I have to set aside time today to do magic. I think about magic as something that is added to my day. So when I wake up, I have a ritual of sorts, and I've always had that. You know, we brush our teeth, we get a drink of water, we might use the bathroom. All of that I started to view as more of like a magical activity, a ritual. And brushing my teeth is infusing, is like... It energizing me. It wakes me up. Drinking water is giving my body hydration and keeping and taking care of myself. So all of that stuff in the morning, you know, then anytime I cook a meal, I consider myself a kitchen witch. So I infuse whatever I'm making with an intention. If I am feeling like I want to be more confident, I'll cook something that has herbs and food items that are associated with confidence. If I am feeling like I need a little bit more protection, I'll cook something that is more associated with protection, and that'll be what I eat. Each evening, I wipe down the counters in the kitchen, and part of that is a ritual of, you know, calming myself down. And in doing so, I, I put that intention of, like, putting the house to sleep. It's time to go to bed and calm down. So the house needs to go to sleep. We turn, I turn out the lights. There's, like, a little song I sing. But all of this stuff, it's things that I do 
normally, you know, normally. And um, I just think about it in a different way. I just have shifted my perspective about how I'm viewing the things that I'm doing in my day. And that's how I feel like I stay connected to my practice. So another, <laughs> what made you get into witchcraft? Well, I'll expand on my story a little bit more because I feel like there's more to share. So I already mentioned that I was, you know, moving away from Christianity. I had this different perspective of, of how I viewed the world. Um, and that witchcraft really fit into that perspective or it explained it a lot better to me. So then what really happened was um, in when I was living in Portland, Oregon, I went climbing at a rock gym with my then boyfriend now husband and we'd only been dating for like a couple months at that point so it was like a cute date idea that he had and he was really into climbing at the time so anyway he took me climbing and I actually fell and I broke my back <laughs> and he felt terrible but um in that healing time when I was healing I you know I couldn't move very well it wasn't so dramatic for me it was a moment where I had to slow down and change the way I was looking at the world and change the way that I was living my life. I was I was moving too fast um, and I wasn't, I didn't really have a direction, but having a broken back and being forced into healing, I wasn't able to nanny anymore. That was the job that I had at the time. Obviously with a baby, you can't have a broken back and keep up with a baby. <laughs> so I was not able to nanny. And so all I could do really was lie flat, watch TV, read books, listen to audiobooks, learned how to crochet. <laughs> but each day I would go outside and I would take my mat, my yoga mat outside. And when it was warm, I would lay out on the front lawn and play my audiobooks, listen to music, write a little bit, do whatever I wanted to do. Just did, and enjoy being outside in the springtime of, of Portland, which is a really lovely time of the year there. And as I was laying there, I was noticing how the world was changing. I was noticing the changing seasons. And I mean, it was specifically from winter to summer. Uh, it was really only about a month. But in that time, I was able to see how the trees were changing. They, they were bare branches of winter. Was, I think it was April. Um, and so then there was like a period where the flowers bloomed each day. They were a little bit bigger and then they fell. So all the petals were falling and then the little buds of the leaves came out and I was able to watch the leaves grow and they were that really bright green color and then they grew and grew bigger and then they were that, you know, darker, more established green color. So in that period of time, I noticed this change and I noticed the grass changing from the yellow of winter to the green of early summer. I don't know that I really ever, I noticed seasons before, of course. We, we experience seasons in most areas of the world of some sort, there's changes in the natural world, but I'd never been like part of it, I guess. Like that was what I was doing. I was witnessing the changing seasons and so it was really eye-opening for me, and I felt really connected to nature at the time, and I was learning about earth-based witchcraft practices and earth-based religions in general, and it was all just coming together. <laughs> so I think that that is what got me really down the path, was kind of this catastrophic event um, that could have been so much worse for me, but ended up not, I still have little twinges of pain, and, and my back's kind of crookedy, but it's, it was, um, it was not obviously as bad as it could have been for me. So now the next question here is tell me where you are going now. Okay. So this was asked last year at the beginning of 2020. So, um, you know, a totally different answer now than I would have said then obviously, but back then it was right when I was starting to write my first book. And so that was really exciting. That was the next step. And so I published Practical Magic for Beginners in uh, last August, actually. So just about a year ago, which is crazy. But that's where I was headed. And now just started up the podcast again with my sister. We're totally revamping Mumbles Academy right now. It was kind of a coding mess from all of the quick fixes I'd done. But now I've done a lot more like cohesive things. So. Um, that's really what I've been focused on is creating a really nice witchcraft community for people to come and gather 
And that's, um, so that's how I would answer that. So the next question, how did you know you were on the right path? Okay, so I just feel like I sort of answered this again in, in the previous questions, but um, it felt like everything was coming together. It's like I said before, I'd always had this idea of things being connected through some sort of force. Uh, all living things, all rocks and trees and plants and people and animals and fungi and all of that being connected. And then when I started learning more about witchcraft and it fit in, it really explained that in a way that made sense to me. That's how I knew. That's how I knew I was on the right path. And then, like I said, with breaking my back and being part of that changing seasons and also learning about our connection to the earth those all just, it all came together for me in a way that made me understand that this is what I want to learn about. This is what I believe in. And so I think that's kind of um, to extrapolate into how someone else might understand if they're on the right path. I think if it feels right, um, and and if you're not, from, if you're not connected with your intuition, which I wasn't at the time, I wasn't, I was totally, didn't trust my intuition at all when I was just starting out with witchcraft, and I've had to learn how to trust my intuition, uh, and I'm still learning, of course. But if you're learning about something and it's making you excited, that is a good sign that you're on the right path. There is some challenges, and again, if you're not really in touch with your intuition to trust it, there can be times where things that you're excited about learning about actually can lead you down not the right path. Uh, you know, that's how people get into cults through indoctrination and, and things like that. That's how uh, conspiracy theories develop through people, you know, feeling like it's the right thing and then uh, not really needing proof for it or needing any sort of evidence, but just believing it because it feels right. So, I mean, that's all topics for another video. But um, for the most part, I feel like if something is exciting you and you want to learn about it, then that's probably a good path to pursue. And just to keep yourself safe by finding a lot of different sources and re researching from many different voices so that you're not, you know, getting indoctrinated into a cult or um, following like a conspiracy theory that has one perspective and, and you need multiple different perspectives to really understand something. Oh, this is a good one because we were just sort of talking about that. So um, this person asks for suggestions on how to sink into natural abilities, manifest, and grow the intuition. So that's great. That's a great question because we were just talking about intuition and not and not really knowing how to trust it. So for for me, um, I think like I said before, giving myself the opportunity to practice was really helpful because. Before, when you're just reading someone else's words and not really practicing your own um, abilities, then you you can't learn it. <laughs> you have to be able to. You have to give yourself that chance to practice in order to learn. It's with any. It's the same with anything. If you want to learn to play the piano, you have to practice. If you want to learn to play basketball, you have to practice. If you want to learn how to write a novel, you have to practice all of these things that you might want to do in life, you have to practice. And it's the same with developing your intuition. So one, a couple of different ideas for developing your intuition. Um, one thing that's really helpful is to be really observant of your surroundings, be observant of patterns that you're noticing. If you're seeing the same shape a lot of different times, if you're seeing the same animal all over the place, um, pictures, the animal in real life, you know, all, the, all these different, or hearing the word of the, the name of the animal. So if you're seeing things repeating, there's probably some sort of sign there and there's something for you to interpret and to um, make meaning of or find the meaning in. I think it's really important when developing your intuitive abilities to be really aware or to be really present in your, in your situation, in your physical reality, being really observant with your eyes, noticing things visually, listening to sounds and being really aware of the sounds around you, understanding the smells, the tastes, the texture, the touch, the, the temperature, the pressure, all of these different ways that you can experience the world around you, being aware of that and present 
because when you get some sort of intuitive nudge, oftentimes they're going to come to you in subtle ways that change, that are perceptive through those senses. So you might hear something, you might have something repeating in your head, a phrase, and you, if you're not aware of the sounds that are around you all the time, you might not hear that. Those are two ways, being more present and, and, and noticing patterns and practicing, I guess, is a third way. I shared a bunch of these in a masterclass a while ago, which I think is still on my channel. Um, I'll link to it if it is, and if not, I'll find a way to share it. But um, I, I did do a masterclass like three years ago about how to be more in touch with your intuitive side. So those are the three that come to my head right off the bat, but if I think of any more, maybe I'll add into it in the next video in this series. And I'll just do, I think, one more question. So this is a good one to end on. Um, and again, like I said before, I got like 200 responses to this survey. So I'm going to be doing more of these videos later on if, if people enjoy them. But this next question that we'll end on is, do you believe simple spells can be as effective as complex spells or complex rituals? And um, I personally believe yes. It's like I was talking about before. I like to incorporate magic into everything that I'm doing throughout the day. I mean, not everything. That's Sometimes you just do things like, you know, without thinking. <laughs> but a lot of the things that I do, I try to do really intentionally and incorporate magic into them. And so I think, and I, I feel like I'm a pretty good manifester. I feel like I often attract the things that I want. I feel, I feel like I'm tend to go in the direction that I want to see in my life. And all of that can be attributed to the intentional way that I live. And so I feel like those are really simple acts to be, to, and I don't put a lot of ritual or, um, you know, frills and lace on, on the things that I do very often. So um, I do think that they can be as effective. I think the real thing here, though, that needs to be brought to attention is that sometimes the ritual and making a big deal about something is what makes it feel a lot more magical. And that can feel more powerful. And so if you put that emphasis on it, that it feels more powerful because I took this time and I really was very intentional about the actions that I did and the materials that I chose and the tools that I chose, that's putting so much energy into this one ritual. And that can be really powerful. So I think, I think it just depends on how you view things and what you need personally, which one is going to be, you know, more powerful. But for me personally, I do believe that simple spells can be as powerful as a complex ritual could be. Um, and also for me, like, I, I personally, I have ADHD and I get distracted really easily. And when I'm in ritual, I do them occasionally. When I'm in ritual, if I get distracted from it or if my mind wanders, which it does a lot, um, I feel like it takes me out of that moment. And then I kind of beat myself up about it that I wasn't, you know, as focused as I should have been. And so the, I put a lot of pressure on myself when I'm doing ritual work. And so I have to be in the right mindset I have to be. There's a very specific set of circumstances that I have to have in order for me to focus in that way. But other people might not have that neurodivergency. If, if you're neurotypical, you might not have that problem <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. And so ritual might be exactly what you need and what you can do really easily. So like I said, I think it's really personal. I think it's what works the best for you and what you feel the most comfortable doing based on how your brain works and how you like practicing in general. So I think that's a good place to leave this. I hope that you all like this style of video. Um, I haven't posted a video in probably like a year. <laughs> so this will probably, um, I'll, I'll just keep doing these and see what happens. <laughs> but I, thank you if you watched this far. Thank you for being here. And if you want to ask questions, I'll link to the same survey that I that I am getting these responses from, and I will start answering those questions as well. So uh, again, thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video.